Welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin, and I have a question for you. How's your sex life? And I don't just mean, how's the sex? Instead, I'm wondering, is it giving you the kind of connection with your partner that you want? Is it playful, present, transcendent? And how do you feel afterwards? Or are there obstacles to your even connecting with your partner, like having a different level of desire or negative past experiences that get in the way of feeling completely present and open to the free flow of love? Today, I'm pleased to have on the show one of the leading sex educators in the world, Diana Richardson. For more than 20 years, she has been teaching about slow sex, a kind of cool sex that will completely transform how you experience yourself and your partner as sexual and sensual beings. She is the author of more than six books on Tantra, producer of the award-winning movie Slow Sex, and people travel from all around the world to take the Making Love seminars that she teaches with her partner Michael in Switzerland. You can check out her website for more information, which is livinglove.com. So, we're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about how to shift in radical, unexpected ways so that it can truly be a source of expansive love, connection, and healing for you and your partner. Diana Richardson, thank you so much for being here on Relationship Alive today. Hi, Neil. Thank you very much for inviting me. Really a pleasure. Absolutely. Um, we have so much to talk about, and I, I just we were talking about this before we started recording that there's so much material, and yet there's there's some simple concepts that it all boils down to. So what I'm hoping is that in our conversation today, and for um, for our listeners, I want you to know that we are actually going to have a part two of this conversation. So um, there's going to be ample opportunity to learn from Diana about what she teaches and how it can totally transform your own relationship with yourself, your your body, your, your sexual self, your sensual self, as well as that with your partners So um, or your partner. Um, so let's dive in. And the first thing that I'm curious about is we there's a lot of talk about Tantra in the popular culture and this, you know, the urban legend about Sting having sex with his wife for seven or eight hours or something like that. And I'm curious if you can just briefly say, you know, what is, what is your version of Tantra versus like, is it different than what someone might can generally understand as Tantra? How would, how would it be different and how would it be similar? Um, it is true there are a lot of threads. And uh, just to start off with Sting, who um, that was said about, I heard him later qualify the statement by saying, actually, I begged for six hours and we made, we made love for one hour. <laughs> um there has been a resurgence of this interest in Tantra, and it is good because the society really does require um, a new look or a look uh, more deeply into sex. At the same time, there are many threads in the field of Tantra that I would not really consider on track, and it's not to you know, be critical or dismissive or anything. It's more, for me, the whole Tantric experience and approach is totally revolutionary you know it cuts all the ties and the threads to what we know about sex conventionally whereas a lot of the tantric um, approaches are still quite conventional in the sense there's still quite an emphasis on orgasm a lot of emphasis on total on not totality but intensity mm -hmm. The mistaking intensity for depth. Mm. And um, so there's a lot of goals have come in through the back door, you know, not one orgasm, but multiple cosmic and, you know, orgasms without ejaculation, orgasms with ejaculation. There's all kind of many agendas in sex, whereas true, true tantric approach is really about being in the awareness. Um, so it's not what you do and how you do it. And when something is done with awareness, 
the whole quality of that that movement, that act, that exchange is transformed through the awareness. So it's to make this fundamental shift in in the human being, you know, and in their psyche, uh, to go more into being and not so much in doing. So what would be what would be a benefit that a, a typical person listening to this interview who's used to conventional sex, which we'll just loosely define as you you get turned on, you have sex, one or both of you has an orgasm, and then it's done. Um, to to what we're talking about, what would be a benefit that someone would notice, or maybe multiple benefits um, that would actually change? They they would notice a huge shift from um, what they're typically doing in their sex lives. Well, firstly. You know, it is a shift and it does take time to establish a new kind of sexual reality or field. Um, so people can be very quick to judge, oh, that was boring or that was like this without really waiting to see the benefits. Um, but as soon as one takes the goal out of sex, especially for men, this reduces the performance pressure and stresses enormously for a man that he doesn't have to have an erection. He doesn't have to make his woman come because in the tantric uh, way or the slow sex way, it's more to be here now and letting the moment unfold, not to kind of enter sex with, with an agenda, with an idea because that makes us very mechanical. Mm. So, when one starts to be more in the here and now with sex and not discharging the energy but containing that vitality, you feel much more relaxed person. You feel more open. You feel more loving. You feel more aware of people around you. So there's a general improvement in the quality of life, the perception of life, and... Um, you know, and people often say, you know, like, well, you know, how will I know it's going to benefit me? It's one of these things you can't know. You have to try. You can't really say to the mind, you know, this and this and this is going to happen and try and convince the mind. It's really people have to be curious, like, you know, I've been having sex for so many decades and it's always followed the same basic pattern. It's enjoyable. Um but at the same time, why not try something else? Because things change through life, and we have to accept so many changes, but on a sexual level, we're not willing to change. Mm. And uh, often changes are there. Uh, you know, with women and the, their supposed changes in menopause, men also have hormonal changes that affect their capacity, we can say. So there's tremendous, tremendous benefit and the longer one can make love for longer if one is not striving to reach the end. Mm. You know, normally we just enter and we just, you know, get into top gear and go to the end. Whereas in slow sex, you let it unfold more. You listen more to the genitals. You're more in your body. So you can make love for one hour, two hours, three hours, and, you know, this eight-hour sting t time format. Okay, he didn't make li love for eight hours, but it is highly possible. Yeah. Um, because the energy is always contained. You're not building it up to a peak and discharging it. So this containment and how you feel afterwards in sex is is actually the convincing thing. Yeah, because something that I've noticed as well, and and – I, I think I've talked about this, although at, at this point, when people hear this episode, they won't have heard the other episodes where I talked about this because we're you're going to be one of our first episodes that we go live with. But um, my partner and I have been working with um, slow sex and and your teachings in Tantra. And it's not only been huge in terms of our capacity for exploring like a wide range of of how we connect with each other in those moments where we're making love. But also I've noticed that it permeates the, like the day it's, it's something that, you know, even when we're not together, 
there's an energy that's that's still connecting us and it's still circulating through each of us separately as well that I would never really notice after conventional sex as great as that was. Wow, beautiful, Neil. It really means, you know, it's just the proof is in um, the eating of it, the tasting of it. And uh, yes, absolutely. And that's the thing with conventional sex. We never, we, the emphasis is on the peak, you know, on getting there and having it. Mm. Um, there's never much reflection on how we feel afterwards. And actually, if you, most people, when they look, there's many, many byproducts of that discharge. You know, people feel, well, men, you know, we know the jokes, they go to sleep, they lose the connection, they dis lose the interest. Women feel abandoned, lonely, sad, men feel empty, tired. Um, but we just think that's part and parcel. And often, even if you watch for several days after, you might feel restless or quick to anger. Or So there's so many consequences to how we have sex that we don't really realize that it's sex itself. Hmm. You know, think, oh, that's just how humans are. So it's wonderful to talk t with you now, you know, as somebody who really has uh, put some guidelines into practice and feels um, the the dimensionality, you know, that it brings to life. Yeah, so, it, so asking you about the benefits was something of a leading question because I'm experiencing them. And at the same time, I think it's helpful for people to hear it from you. Um, and particularly when it comes to, here's something that I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on, um, because sex, um, well, some couples, it's great. And they're, you know, they're always, they're matched in terms of their levels of desire, in terms of the way they want to have sex. And that's true for some people. However, in my experience with talking to people, working with people, that seems to be rarely the case. And that actually sex can become a great source of conflict for people. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak to that and how this approach can help resolve um, differences in terms of desire or, you know, some person always wanting sex, another not, or, or timing. And, um, you know, they, they actually want sex, but they always want it at opposite times or things like that. How, how can this affect um, people who are in those kinds of situations with their partners? Well, often this difference in what we can say interest level um, is to do with um, not understanding really the body magnetics. And more often than not, it will be the woman who is less interested. And the reason for that is, is that the way woman is designed, the way her energy opens, the way her body opens, is that it really takes a lot longer than man's body. It's nothing to do with frigidity or being closed or blocked. It's just you know, a basic reality. And there are explanations for that, which we can talk about l later. But um, what happens with women is she just lets man into her before she's ready. And you ask any woman, almost 100% across the board, do you let your man in too soon? And, and a woman will say yes. So we know that we need more time to be really willing and open to have sex. Now, a body that again and again goes in, man goes in too soon, the body loses interest. So it's often not, a, you know, usually not a psychological factor. It's more the body closing down factor because woman is never really, really open to receive male energy. And when woman's body is not open, male energy has got nowhere to go. So, you know, as far as timing goes, okay, we can talk about nighttime or morning time, but it's on another level is that women needs more time. This instant sex, you know, when man gets an erection, wants to go in there <laughs> immediately, you know, this doesn't work for women. Women are, we're very good at pleasing man. We do many things to, to make the man happy sexually and um, override often the truth of our own bodies. So, in the end, it works against ourselves and then man. But if 
couples really give themselves, you know, two, three hours to make love, lie around, kiss, cuddle, don't be in a hurry, wait until, you know, woman's body opens. And um, so when we get that kind of a timing right, that the bodies are ready for each other, then a lot of the problems drop away. Um, desire is an interesting concept. Um, we we have the idea that we need to feel desire to have sex, mm-hmm. but in fact we don't. So it's also slow sex. You can choose to have sex. It's not about feeling desire or feeling hungry. In fact, if you're feeling hungry, um, you're more likely to go into the hot, intense version, mm-hmm. if you know what I'm saying. Sure. Um, so, firstly, we don't really need desire. We just need the decision. The bodies are mostly happy to make love. The mind is often a little bit resistant to being in the present, to having to, you know, be here, not watch a movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, you said that in, in Slow Sex, that the movie – that if you're if you're waiting for your mind to be ready for sex, then it could be a long wait. But your body, if you can sort of bypass your mind, your body is often willing and 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 act and eager to have that kind of connection with another. Yes, yes, exactly. And when when one makes an appointment and does it more consciously, it really lifts or elevates the whole experience to something very different to when you just like happen to fall into bed together and have a, you know, 15, 20 minutes of sex. Right. I like the way you put that to make an appointment. Um, A lot of people talk about scheduling sex and that doesn't sound very appealing to me, but making an appointment, it's like there's something about (laughs) that. that's. (laughs) Well, it is helpful. It is helpful. I mean, I I can hear what you're saying about the wording, but it is helpful to to create the space because we tend to put love, um, you know, it's very low priority. Yeah. In terms of how much time we devote to it, it's high priority in terms of, you know, what it brings us and so on. Uh, but actually, the time we give for love is minimal, especially if we parents and have children and people are working and. Uh, survival unfortunately takes over Mm. and so our priorities then also shrink and uh, so that's why appointments are great or dates make a date to make love (laughs) yes can we can we go back quickly to what you were talking about um with the, the difference between um women and men and i mean there's a lot to say there obviously um but one thing that made an enormous impression on me when the first book of yours that I that I read, um, I guess you co-wrote it with with Michael, your partner, um, Tantric Sex for Men. I mean, all your books are so rich and amazing. This one in particular, the you wrote about how for most women there's something inherently traumatic or traumatizing about conventional sex and the way that it happens. And I, I heard you alluding to that in um, in that idea that if if that happens one too many times where the man's excited, the woman isn't quite there yet, but you know, for whatever reason, time pressure needing wanting to please or pressure from the person or whatever, the the actual intercourse is happening too quickly, that that a woman's body may just start shutting down rather than going into a place of wanting to open to her partner. So first, I guess I just wanted to highlight that because that concept in itself blew my mind. I remember I was reading it and my partner was sleeping next to me and I just, I felt moved like practically to tears just imagining that that could have been her experience of of having sex with me, that it could have actually been creating trauma for her. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, it's it's a huge subject. And basically, 
you know, there definitely are women and men who as children have been sexually abused. So there's, a, you know, many, many people who do have this trauma. But aside from that, the conventional way is traumatic for women in the sense of what I was mentioning earlier, that woman's body is not really open. So man goes in there, he's pretty aggressive, he's pretty unconscious. Um, just because that's the style we think goes, that's what we see in the movies, what we see in porno and so on. So, th you know, so what's happening, woman has to defend herself energetically from man because it's just too strong. Woman cannot open her body. Um, like the vagina, you know, if a man is going hard and deep, and he hits the cervix, it's very painful. So a woman is constantly closing this organ, holding it tight, and makes it completely unreceptive mm. because she's designed to receive a penis, a conscious penis, and then she's really, you know, a whole different level of exchange starts to happen because the male energy flows from the penis is received into the vagina. So this constantly having to defend um, against men is, is traumatic and because women again and again are going over their boundaries, you know, saying yes too soon. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and the vagina, she's a very delicate place. She's not a rough place. And the way, you know, the way the penis is in the vagina and women will encourage it because women think that's, you know, women think according to the conditioning, our conditioning, that's what uh, is is necessary, where that's what we want. So women will say to men, harder, harder. But this is women in the conventional picture. Um, so in this level, you know, that woman is always in a protective mode in relation to man it is traumatic for her and that also then affects her relationship with man and the harmony with man. Whereas as soon as man is more conscious and present in a woman, then she can relax and then truly open and access feminine energies. And when women can access them, then man can access them too. But this conventional style of mechanical thrusting, it raises sensation, it raises um, intensity, um, but it doesn't involve really this capacity, inherent capacity of the genitals to convey vitality energy. Penis transmits and conveys, woman receives and absorbs. So there's an alchemy there designed by nature um, to happen that we are completely overriding. So in that sense, we can say that you know, both men and women, we've lost our true male qualities and female qualities that we've both become quite distorted mm. um, as men, as women. And a lot is to do with the how of we are, how we are having sex. And um, yeah, one thing that just popped into my mind as a metaphor for what you just said was I'm imagining the different ways that electricity can flow and that our um, traditional way of having sex is like a buildup of static electricity where you're just, and you can even uh, imagine that, you know, you're, you rub, 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 and then you go and touch something and bam, you, you know, you get that shock mm -hmm. and then it's over. Um, and, and you can't get into a state of flow when you are building up static electricity. I mean, I think there's a reason that in order to run the lights in our house, we don't have like a, a household supply of balloons. And if you want to run the lights in the kitchen, you just rub the balloon against the light, you know, for for half an hour, and then you get light in your kitchen. We rely on a state of flow to actually be useful for us in our electrical lives. And it makes sense to me that that if you're pursuing a, a more static electrical approach to sex that you're missing out on the opportunity of experiencing the the flow that can actually be there yes absolutely and and also to recognize this is how nature designed us mm. and and just like wow you know it's 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 subtle 
and we're a bit, you know, fixed on sensation. So it really requires this shift, you know, from sensation to sensitivity to um, giving value and awareness to the subtle. But the difficulty, you know, it's not like we lose the capacity or the ability to sense this um, level. It's just we overriding it. And that overriding and the tension pattern involved is really making us less and less sensitive. So there is this level where, you know, too much sensation, then ultimately you're pretty dead to yourself. Mm. And... Um, yeah. Yes, the, the other, sorry, if we can, this other reason why it's traumatizing for women is goes to this basic thing, which we do need to talk about, is this Please. difference in polarity, mm. you know, about women's body opening more slowly. Yes. Um, because it's, it's a magnetic thing uh, in that in, in the male body, energy is raised from the penis and the perineum, this area, um, that's called man's positive pole. And his, like a magnet, his receptive pole is in the heart and the chest. Now, woman, she's reversed. Her energy raising, her life sustaining pole is the breasts, and the vagina is the, the feminine pole, mm. uh, the more receptive pole. The way we understand and and approach sex as women conventionally, and you know, men are supporting this as well, is that we think the clitoris is where it's all at. Mm. You know, of course, the clitoris is capable of getting excited and uh, getting horny and, and building sensation. Um, but this is, doesn't really, really open the woman's body. Woman's body is open through her breasts, you know, so she's that's her point of where to access her body on a deeper level. And that's why it takes longer because from the breasts, then there's this resonance after some time in the vagina where the vagina then has this capacity, receptive power. Um, and receptivity is not passivity. It's really a power to take the male energy. So this is um, really something... Yeah, to begin to honor and make a shift from clitoris and excitement to the breasts and a, a deeper awakening in woman's body. And so because this has not been understood in the past, this has been quite traumatic for women. Um, and that's why she's developed very strongly um, this pleasing pattern with men. For centuries, women have been doing it. Um just whatever man wants, we say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, men equally, you know, they have stresses. I'm not saying it's only one way. Men have, um, I mentioned earlier, tremendous performance pressure, that right. they have to have an erection, that they only a real man if they pa, 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 pa. So a lot of identification for a man on how he performs in bed. And... You know, there is more and more erectile dysfunction happening. Porno and this whole, how to say, more extrovert sensation type of way of being with the body is adding to that. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, like a lot of masturbation or a lot of stimulation or a lot of mechanical action with the penis, this is not enhancing his uh, innate capacity to convey energy is just making you know the penis kind of like tough and rigid and in a way less perceptive so conventional sex is traumatizing for both men and women because there's so many stresses expectations uh, management involved <laughs> Yeah, and when you talk about um wow, there there's just so much breadth to your work. When you talk about um emotions and feelings and and how their um emotions are often triggered from it's actually a past experience. It's not really necessarily something to do with the present moment. That got me to thinking about how we all probably, with the way that we learn about sex in society, assuming we even have a, 
a um, a course that doesn't involve explicit trauma of some sort, it's still kind of traumatizing because you have these moments where you don't really know what to do, but maybe you're you're expected to know what to do, or you get someone laughs at you at the wrong moment or you you come too quickly or whatever it is there are there are all of these moments that are possible i mean maybe it's even your first orgasm where you're like kind of surprised and like wondering like if there's like what's going on with your with your body or or whatever all of those things have this capacity to really put us on this continuum where we've lost touch with the ability to be truly open and in the moment about what we're experiencing. Yes, and relaxed, and relaxed, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think a lot of it is to do, well, for sure, many people have traumatic experiences in their sexual evolution. You know, for small things like you just mentioned now that are big things. Um, but... I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're just talking, people. We're just talking. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question for you, and this is getting back to the discussion on polarity. Um, and and this was interesting to me that um, this talk about the, the breasts in a woman and that being a positive uh, a source of, of generating energy, a positive polarity. And... Um, so what does that mean practically for maybe a woman on her own in terms of how she um, con conceptualizes her her breasts and her relationship to them? And also, what does that mean in terms of when people are in bed together, um, how, how one thinks about the breasts? Um, it sounds like before you think about a vagina, a clitoris, or anything. Um, so I, I'm just, you've got me thinking. And of course, I know some of the answers to this because I've read your books. And But I, I think people at home are probably like, well, what do you mean, like the breasts? Like, what do, what do I do about my breasts or my partner's yes, breasts? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so for, first of all, women, women alone, um, woman needs to start to feel her breasts from inside as an integral part of her body. Um, for many women, they're, they're very objective about their breasts. They look at their breasts from the outside. They judge them. They change them. Um, but to start to value this area, of course, it's connected to the heart, but it's a very powerful energy center. And in women, this is how and where our body opens from, how we open to ourselves. And women know that the breast is connected, you know, to vagina and so on, but we don't really know the sequence. Mm -hmm. And men also, we kind of think breasts is like an op optional extra or bit of decoration, but really they're fundamental in um, a woman really, really getting awakened uh, and open to sex. So women on her own, if she can hold her breasts at night last Thing, you know for 20 minutes and just begin to melt into them merge with them of course many women can't feel into breasts they've lost sensitivity there so it's definitely not about stimulating the breasts woman herself or man um, but just more to love the breasts to hold them to send warmth into them so that a woman can fall back into her body and then she will start to feel how the body in a more global way starts to to open. So woman has to make a shift uh, in herself during her day, also when she is together with a man, not to be striving so much with the clitoris. If she can, let the clitoris be more to the side, um, not, not, you know, trying to make herself come, but rather keep her awareness in the breasts and man... Also, like I said, not to stimulate the nipples, just to hold the breasts, be present in, in the man, his hands, melt with the breast. That woman can, you know, like I said, relax back and, and open to herself because that's eventually what we are missing in the conventional way is we're not really opening to anybody. We're just getting excited. Um, and we do have this idea we open to somebody else, but it's never that. It's we open to ourselves, and it's from that 
falling back into yourself, opening into yourself, that then something more can happen between the bodies. So it's good for man not to try and, you know, play with the clitoris, not to excite women, because an excited vagina is a very, very different place and space to a, a receptive vagina, uh, one that's not um, excited. The excited changes the vibration. Sometimes there's even women will experience like a little pain, a little ache in the vagina through the tension of the excitement. Um, yeah, the, um, and, the question that comes up for me around this is, so you're, how do you avoid being goal oriented? This was one of the very first things that you said in this conversation, but how do you avoid being goal oriented around Tantra? You know, like, like, okay, how long should I be melting with the breasts? And, you know, when do I move on from melting with the breasts? And, you know, those kinds of thoughts, yeah. you know, how do you, how do you presence yourself in those moments so that it's Ooh. more of a flow? Um, firstly, when I talk about goal orientation, I'm really talking about this really deep belief that we have that sex equals coming. Mm. Sex equals a peak and a discharge. So that's what I mean when we just kind of like get together and go for it to create this short experience. Um, but yes, of course, it's not to have a goal with the breasts or any other part of the body. It's more just to have understanding. Mm. Oh, this is why I'm here. And then with that comes, you know, more compassion, more patience, more feeling, more sensitivity. Because when man feels, you know, that woman is relaxing and opening, um, this is also tremendous. You know, this feeling, often man has a feeling he's got to like push through a series of defenses, you know, till finally he kind of wins over. Right. Um. So... Communication is good, you know, it's like uh, you can ask something, you know, how does it feel or is this enough or you have to use your intuition. It's not like suddenly you have another set routine, but just to know that, oh, it's really good if I let my woman lie around in bed with me for half an hour, an hour before I make a sexual approach. I'm not saying that time frame as a black and white thing, but, you know, just let's kiss and cuddle. And, um, you know, just create more space for different experiences and to move away from this building up of, of excitement to more relaxing into the body and feeling what is present in the body. And what I wanted to say about a vagina is that when a vagina is excited, she's kind of hungry and demanding. So... When the penis comes in there, you know, there's this extra pressure. And this will also often cause a man to come mm. uh, too soon. So women's level of excitement and, and man's uh, coming soon are very connected. Man also comes because of in performance stresses, internal stresses, mind stresses. But through making women more excitement, he's actually debilitating himself. So there's many ways where a man can just drop back more in himself, be more present, feel the body, scan for tensions, just be more, for both man and woman really, more natural and uh, more ordinary, uh, more vulnerable. Um, but certainly the value of changing the way one makes love is just, you know, not to be underestimated. Many of us are okay with our sex lives. We've accepted them or we've moved on to other partners and still we've ended up with the same issues. But it's not s sex per se that doesn't work. It's how we have sex that is causing difficulties and challenges and problems. So there is much to be gained, much... Um, and like you say, with your partner, you know, how it, it goes beyond the bed. It stretches into, you know, the fabric of life. Right. Yeah, that I realized what my question actually was, the, the goal-oriented question. The question was more that I think 
typically when when you're um, in bed with your partner, let's say, and you're touching each other, then you might be paying attention to the level of excitement or stimulation that you're feeling as a gauge of whether it's going well or not. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, and, and you mentioned some things, but around how, what are you shifting your attention to? What are you paying attention to if not that question of, well, am I getting turned on? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question because it's hard for the mind to imagine not doing something. <laughs> 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 um, look, it is a shift for people, especially when we've been doing it for one way, doing it one way, and we want to change. Um, the thing is, to the basic thing problem with us is we lack body education. You know, mm. all our education is mind edu education, so it's very difficult for us to be in the body and be present. Because to be present, you need to be in the body. There's no other way because the body is the bridge to the present. So the whole thing is to be more conscious in your body and, uh, you know, to relax tensions, to breathe deeply, to take the perception down more to a, a feeling sense kinesthetic level away from, you know, like a more stimulation thing that's imposed on the body, rather feel what is present in the body. And this takes, you know, it takes a little practice, but again and again, you know, relax the jaw, relax the pelvic floor, men relax the anus, uh, use eye contact to bring you more here, you know, uh, caressing with consciousness. It's just... Uh, to bring the attention back into one's own body, not to focus it on the other person. So this is where the lack of body education has also come into sex, is we, we tend to be out of ourselves and on the other instead of back in ourselves and starting at home, you know, with mm. our own body as the starting point. Yeah, just this morning I was reading in your Tantric Love Letters book, which... I found to be a really great way to talk about the material. It's a, for people listening, it's a, a series of correspondences that, that you've had with people over the years, people who have taken your, um, your seminars, people who have read your books and who are talking about their experience with, with the material, their questions and, and your answers to them, which are very thoughtful and, um, and, one of the things that you were talking about was the importance of like being in yourself fully that there's this conventional notion of being completed by your your partner but that actually it's getting in touch with yourself as a whole being and then being able to meet with your partner from that place of of being whole. And that's what I'm hearing you saying about like bringing your attention back to yourself and what your experience is and, and that that will, can actually guide you in terms of how you do connect with through your touch, your eye contact, your yes, penetration. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And really, the, the, the whole thing is to do with awareness, you know, touch with awareness, enter w woman's body with awareness, kiss with awareness. Uh, you know, to bring that um, mechanic, take that mechanical aspect out. And mm. as soon as you bring awareness in, you know, paying attention to everything, um, this is what causes these shifts or creates the shifts, we can say. Yeah, and that shift is where that lovemaking can be truly a healing force for people. Yes, absolutely. And um, it is so amazing just that awareness is a healing force. So awareness in sex, one is, can do healing and cleansing on the deepest level possible. Um, so it's so empowering and powerful what can happen in the name of sex, you know, in comparison to the way we are using it today, which is you know, on many levels, a tremendous, tremendous loss of energy. 
Mm. And um, yeah, so it would be wonderful if more people, and I believe people are, but it's slow, you know, getting yeah interested in exploring alternatives because the conventional is a little bit of a dead end road. You know, the only thing to change it is then to change a partner. Right. But then that also has its end. (laughs) (laughs) You know? Um, Right, and can create a lot of problems too. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. So, and I mean, this has been my experience, but it it sounds like uh, approaching sex in this way, it's constantly generative and expansive and... And it doesn't lead to growing tired of your partner. Yes, that's right. That's what's amazing. Because one is, you know, just tuning in on such a diff- different level, um, you know, where there's a real ce- cellular connection. And um, so in that sense, it's very healing for, for couples. And having worked now like over 20 years with couples, so many people couples come to us, um, my partner and I, we do these workshops, and really on, on the brink of separation, but again and again, just a, you know, a reorientation, a new understanding, and um, it's amazing uh, how couples can just get on track again, you know, find the love again, and uh, move forward. Right, I think it turns out that the love was probably actually there, it just was maybe being overridden by their fear or um oh yes we just we 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 lose ex we lose access to it so yeah. yes it's there but we stop feeling it and feeling you know how enchanting that is <laughs> you've, yeah. you've mentioned a couple times um women feeling pain in their in their vagina and I'm I'm curious about that because there are lots of testimonials in your books around women having that experience and it going away from yes yes. S- so why does that happen and what's what's shifting that's allowing that to happen? Uh, um, well, it ha- very high percentage of women, young and older, have pain during intercourse, and it's one of the most difficult things for a woman to admit. And often a woman will make sounds of pleasure. Uh, when actually it's, she's hurting. Um, a lot of it is to do with man being unconscious in women, like an unconscious penis doesn't feel good really in the vagina. Part of it is to do with women also holding her vagina tight um, uh, to st- inhibit the depth of penetration. Mm. Um, women herself, her vagina not really being open, uh, in the deeper ways via the breasts, as we talked earlier. So sometimes, you know, if a woman has been traumatized earlier in her life, there can be residual memories that have then formed uh, into pains. Mm-hmm. So there's many, many reasons why. And what makes the shift is the consciousness. You know, Mm. the slowing down, man really entering woman consciously, women taking the time, man allowing woman the time for her body to open. Um, You know, to enter, always to use lubrication, like coconut oil, or um, so that the entry is very smooth and very slow and... uh, so the vagina can relax. And it's amazing. In two, three days, women who've had problems for years, they go away. Wow. Yeah. Plus women and men as well, we're always holding the pelvic floor tight, uh, unconsciously. Mm-hmm. Um, so with women, that includes the vagina. So really good for women in the day to again and again relax the vagina. Um, but yes, I mean, I'm... Even that I have been working this long in the field, I'm again and again just stunned at how these things can change in such a short time. In a recent group, there was a woman of 70. Yeah, she was 70. Her man was 66. They hadn't been together long, but she'd had this very long, loving marriage, but with no sex. And it was impossible for the man even to enter. She was so tight and contracted. But really, within three days in the workshop, 
the understanding, the slowness, like I said, giving bodies, woman's body more time. So it is this that women has, um, I don't want to use the word suffering, you know, but ha- has had to deal with a lot mm. through the misunderstanding. And it's been going on for, for centuries. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this becomes a a bridge for people to really, I I mean, I think a lot of women are probably feeling that and not even understanding what's necessarily wrong. And so, and, and because, as you said, many of them are afraid to admit that that's what's happening, then it's like anything where you, you live in, you know, kind of in isolation or this, this secret, (laughs) thing that's actually you know getting in the way of you actually experiencing what you what you really want well that that is true that people do feel very isolated and don't talk about it because in response um you know to my women's book tantric orgasm for for women Mm -hmm. as well as also more recently now from the men's book i get these messages from people saying oh my god finally you put words to what i've been feeling and i feel so relieved Mm. Uh, you know, because people think they're wrong or something, you know, something that was a problem suddenly ceases to be a problem. So it's like many, many people know the, know the stuff, uh, what their body likes, what their body wants, what their body doesn't want, but we just kind of um, override it. Uh, so... Yeah, and one yeah. thing that I I love about your work is in that awareness there's that acceptance of this is what this is what my experience is right now whether it's like immense pleasure or that pain or I need to cry or whatever it is and and having those things actually be gateways into further connection and moments to create a pause or space or or more of an allowing with your partner. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because this is when they, you know, really one lets the healing through. Yeah. And um, the beauty is when, when things move, old memories or pains, one doesn't even have to understand them, that it is so liberating, you know, also for every cell in the body and for the heart. And so that's beautiful when, you know, there is that, level of being open to oneself and vulnerable, you know, in f- with and to your partner. Yeah. So for you listening, I I want you to get even more of an understanding of, of what we're talking about. And uh, Diana Richardson has been so generous to offer us even more time to talk and to get into some of more of the, the nitty gritty of how you do um, cool sex slow sex um and uh of course we've we've offered some some uh ideas and suggestions over the past 45 minutes or so um but stay tuned we are going to have a second part of this interview um in the meantime if you are interested uh to find out more about diana richardson and her work you can visit livinglove.com which is her website she has several books available on through Amazon or through her website um, in a multitude of languages. So if you're, if you're listening to me in English, but want to read in German, that option is available to you. And um, I'm also going to provide links to Diana's site and her work uh, through my website. So you, if you go to neilsatin.com slash tantra, T-A-N-T-R-A, Um, then you'll find a link to Diana's site, her books. Uh, You can download the show notes from this episode. And if you're driving, you can also, at the next opportunity, which I would prefer you be stopped, um, you can text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444, and I'll make sure that you get um, an easy way through your email to, um, to access the, uh, the information that we've been talking about here. Oh, and I don't want to forget that um, Diana's also been generous enough to offer a signed 
uh, copy of one of her books. So um, if you're interested in the in the giveaway, then definitely text the word passion to 33444, download the show guide, and, um, and we'll get you entered in the giveaway for one of her amazing, amazing books they've been. I, I don't, I mean, in a sense, it's kind of, it could be cliche on the show because I only like to talk to people who have written life-changing books, but this is truly a case where um, this work has been profoundly transformative in terms of my relationship with my partner. And, um, and so I'm so grateful both uh, Diana for you taking the time to chat with us today and also for your c contribution to my own development as well as those of the people, who, other people who have worked with you. Oh, beautiful, Neil. So thank you so much for coming on today and stay tuned for part two, everyone. And thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.